Ladies and gentlemen of the podcast world, if you're listening to us, if you're watching us, if you're live with us, we love you all the more. It is I, Josh Horowitz, but more importantly, it is my guest, Mr. Graham McTavish. Graham, welcome to the podcast, sir. Josh, always a pleasure to podcast with you, if that is indeed a, a thing. It's a verb it now. Sounds like a, yes, yes, it sounds like a sort of strange sport that's only played <laughs> north of Finland or something, but yeah. It's the one sport I'm decent at, actually. <laughs> well, that's one more than me. So I, um, I do not believe you. I've seen the workouts. Um, it's good to see you, my friend. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, I'm, I'm so thrilled that we have this live audience watching along with us. If you're live, we, we love you all the more. If you're watching this in 12 years, we still love you. After the apocalypse, wow, we hope you're enjoying this as a nice, you know, the, the end of the world moment when you're looking at this. <laughs> Let's look at that podcast again. Exactly. Yeah. One more time. Yeah. So let me let, let me tell the audience, first of all, um, we're going to have a great chat today, Graham and I, as we always do. We're going to talk about a great many things, including his amazing new series, House of the Dragon, which is going to have, I think, a sizable number of you very much interested. I've seen the first they episode. Might, people might watch it. Yes. I have a sneaky suspicion. Um, we're also going to take some questions from you guys. So... Yeah. Here's how this is going to work. You, uh, some of you are very smart already. You've seen the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. Click on that Ask a Question button, write in your question, and if you are so bold, if you feel like it, and you want to be potentially on camera if we select your question, just write that in the question. Say, cool to be on camera, yes on camera, just so I know. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, certainly. No, no, we will not put you on the spot. No, no. So um, we'll get to your questions in a bit, but first let's catch up, Graham, you and I. Um, yes. I feel like you are, you're a pretty busy man in, in mm -hmm. showbiz, which is a good problem to have for any working actor. Um, yes. You yes. just, you were just telling me, are we, are we allowed to say what you're wor working on yes. right now? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So you're, yeah. you're working on The Witcher right now. Yeah, I, I am working on The Witcher, yes. Uh, which has been great, great fun, really enjoyable actually. Are you are you generally the kind that likes to be have work back to back to back? Do you need some downtime? Are well, the you... thing is, Josh. What the thing I've learned over my immensely long career, as Sam would love to remind you of, um, how how old I am. But I've been doing this for nearly forty years now, <clears throat> and it do, and it honestly doesn't matter whether you're busy or not busy. Um, you you always have this terrible fear, this terrible fear. I mean, I think it was Paul Newman, actually, who said that he always imagined that somebody was going to come up to him and tap him on the shoulder and say, oh, I'm tired, I'm terribly sorry, it's been a mistake. You're terrible. Right. You're awful. And every actor I know believes that, that there's always a little tiny bit of you that is going, you're a complete fraud. You're a complete fraud. They're eventually going to see through it. And, um, and I think it comes with the territory of, of pretending constantly to be someone else when you're right. working, uh, that that that's going to just come unstuck in some way. But well, I, not to mention I, all the years yeah. that every actor suffers of rejection. Even the best actors are oh. denied for years. So like that's ingrained into you too, no matter oh, how long. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I mean, and that's you know, in in all seriousness, that's one of the reasons I think that that Sam and I. Um, wanted to do something like Men in Kilts, for instance, and write the books, because you actually, and in his case, you know, the whiskey and, and all the rest of it, uh, that it takes, you have more control over your life. Uh, and certainly when we were doing Men in Kilts, one of the things that we loved about it was that we were literally calling the shots. We were, especially in the first season, we were the guys on the ground going, right, let's let's shoot this. And then we would just start talking to whoever we were with yeah. But it felt very liberating, whereas in your regular life as an actor, almost no control. Are just, yeah, you're waiting for them to go. It's okay. We'll let we'll let you do it for today. <laughs> for six minutes, you can work. Yeah, yeah that's well, right. yes. that struck go me ahead. actually about the because I didn't realize when you guys first did Men in Kilts, like just how mm. running gun it was <gasps> at first. Like creating, you basically were creating like a presentation tape to sell to. Yes. What eventually became stars, and you just did it yes. essentially on your own. Yes, we did. I mean, um, it went from, I mean, I think a lot of people may know this, but it went from him, me, me having an idea of years and years ago, 30 years ago, about doing DVDs about clans, and then him ringing me saying, hey, you, you know, that thing that you were talking about doing a documentary, would you want to do that? Yes. 
uh, let's do it as a podcast. No, let's do it with GoPros on our faces. No. <laughs> and then he got, um, it's incredible. I, I would actually love to have tried that just to see what it looked like. <laughs> just a GoPro on his forehead. Right. You can't cover the moneymaker, though, Graham, for either of you. You can't block any part of your face. What are you thinking? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he, he um, and then and then Sam said, look, look, let's just crew it up and get get some of the guys we know from Outlander. Right. And, and we literally became this weird little dysfunctional group on the road uh, charging from one place to another. Um, we had this wonderful um, producer on it, Michelle Medfin, who who helped us enormously with right. just the logistics of it. And um, yeah, we were run and gun is exactly right. We were, you know, got into the van. He was still hung over. I had no idea. I was very hung over. He was he was technically still drunk, I think. Maybe. I'm not sure. I mean, he's he always at a base him. level. There's always like a slight whiskey content in the blood you're that right, can't be erased. Right. Yeah. You, you absolutely hadn't thought of that. Yeah. There's always just a kind of undercurrent of booze <laughs> that just follows him around. And yeah. uh, but then we drove straight to a whiskey tasting. <laughs> They're perfect. It's going to catch up with them one of these days, I hope, at least. Oh, it will, yes. <laughs> it, it, but it strikes me, uh, on a serious note, like you're on the acting side, because, like, I mean, like we've talked a bunch in recent years, and I've looked at sort mm. of like your body of work, and you have been working virtually your entire life. But like, it's fair to say, correct me if I'm wrong, that yes. the last 10 years have been by far the most prosperous, at least in film and TV. You've been doing theater yes. forever, et cetera. But like, what do you make of that? Has it does that give you a different perspective when you're a jobbing actor for decades, and then all of a sudden, mm. Preacher, Hobbit, Outlander, how, uh, game, game, the Game of Thrones spinoff? Like, this is the this is yeah. the stuff people are aspiring to the, all their lives, and it call, all kind of has happened to you now. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm I'm certainly aware of it, and I'm uh, very appreciative of it and all of that stuff. I I, I, I mean, I think. What having a, a, a career, you know, when I when I did The Hobbit, I was uh, I was just about to turn fifty. So I got I got The Hobbit when I was forty nine, right. and um, you know I'd obviously been working for the best part of thirty years up till that point, and uh, and you know and I I I worked, you know I actually always made a living as an actor, but it's it, it's a precarious world, um, but I I. So having that context for anything that I'm doing now, you're a, I mean, like particularly when I did The Hobbit, um, because that was, that was such a great opportunity. Um, when I was on set, you know, a lot of people who will remain, remain nameless complained about the costume, the right. uncomfortable, the prosthetic, the days, the, the hours, the, the, the fighting, the tiredness and all the rest of it. And, and I, I never complained because I knew how lucky I was to be standing there doing that because I, I knew, you know, I'd had 30 years of dreaming of doing something like that and, right. and for it to be a reality. Uh, it was the same when I did Rambo with Stallone, you know, when I'm standing there on set looking at a man who I grew up with as Rambo, you know, I, I, <laughs> right. I, I had this complete out of body experience on that job where he was talking to me in a take and I was delivering my lines. But at the same time, I was aware that there was like a ticker tape saying you're talking to Rambo. Yep. And and it was it was like that that Schwarzenegger film, The Last Action Hero, where <laughs> where the kid steps into the movie. And whatever yeah, it was. It, it was that kind of feeling. And so I'm very appreciative of um, what I'm doing. And uh it, it makes you um, it makes you more kind of energetic for, for stuff. Uh, so I'm and, and Sam, I know, actually, in a weird way, from my, I'm maybe speaking out of turn, you know, he would maybe say something different. But I know for him that the Outlander was obviously a, a fantastic opportunity. And he'd be the first person to admit it. And, you know, it's not like he had some gigantic film and television career prior to that sure. so he was he also is aware of the business and um and i think both he and i and going back to many kilts want to make hay while the sun shines really you know it's it's uh we want to keep doing interesting stuff or well, i certainly do and i know he does uh and um you know keep keep ahead of them until they catch up with you and go no no 
back in the box for you. It's not going to happen, thankfully. <laughs> but the yeah, well, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. All the best of them have imposter syndrome. Every every actor worth his salt thinks they're oh, yeah. going to have the rug pulled out on them. And I don't trust the ones, frankly, that think they have it made. No, no, that's no, the one to worry no, about. <laughs> no, well, you have to. I think the the one thing that you have to have, uh, well, maybe more than one thing. Well, many things, but one of them is is a sort of edge and a hunger, right? And a, a sort of that kind of um, engine inside you yeah. that is propelling you forwards. The the moment where you just sort of go, well, it's all done. I'm yep. you know, I'm, I'm finished. It's all great. Uh, I think that's when the wheels will eventually come off uh but uh, either that or drug rehabilitation oh, right. <laughs> it's, it's years away years years, years. years. let's talk can you can you can you give us a little taste of uh, so men in kilt season two you, you shot you shot different locale not in scotland but a familiar land for you at least new for sam new zealand. New zealand. Yep. that's that's right so um i don't think we have a release date yet but i'm hoping yeah. relatively soon we'll get some well, news I, I, no well they, 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 they always keep these things bare. yeah I mean, I have no idea when The Witch is going to come out. We didn't know when House of the Dragon was going to come out until... And that's only because I know the showrunner. Right. I think I found out in, like, May, something like that, April. Right. Um, and the same with The Witcher, and with Men and Kills, the same. So, I don't know. I I, I would I would be guessing that it would come out uh, before the next season of Outlander. That would make sense. Yes. One drafting off the other. Who's, yeah, exactly. So what? So who, is there more aggravation on one side or the other this time? What can we look forward to in just, in terms is of just, killed? yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean. We don't no. like to see you happy. We want to see you drive each other you insane. Won't. On the brink of no. madness, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, the edge of the abyss. Exactly. <laughs> just that one little, one step yep, away. staring into the abyss. <laughs> And the abyss <laughs> happens to be called Sam Hewen. And, yeah, those uh, beautiful he, eyes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He um, he just insisted on making me more scared. That was, he lives for it. I think he lives, be- honestly, Graham, and I, and I feel privileged to say this, I feel like he lives to torment you and I. I mean, you are closer with him than I, but like, mm. I feel like I'm in that nice little, like, there's something fucked up in him. There's something wrong with him. He likes to, to make his friends feel I mean, pain. I'm, I'm, I'm not giving anything away particularly, but we do talk at one point during Men and Kills. So I say, you know, with the whole competitiveness. Yeah. You know, I, I said to him, hey, I mean, you have you always been like this? And sort of this ridiculous, really obsessive, competitive side to him. Right. I said, have you always been like that? And he said, no, 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 not at all. No. I said, so you're, you're not like this with other people? He said, no, no, it's really only you. It's just you. <laughs> and I quote, I just want... I, I don't only want to beat you, I want to smash you. Is that the word of a kind person? It's, it's, it's yeah. an unwell man. It's an unwell it man. A, it yeah. was an epiphany for me. I realized that I was in a camper van with a lunatic and <laughs> he was driving. And uh, yeah, my life was literally in his hands. And, and wow. yeah. I'm, I'm petrified because when last I saw him, I surprised him <laughs> in London. Oh, I don't know if you saw this, but I so at the Outlander premiere, we oh, engineered no. this whole thing where I, he, I we we told him I, I couldn't make it, and then I surprised him in a hotel room with a camera crew, and we had it all on tape and made him, you know, we saw it all. It, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful thing. I'll share the video with you. Would and have been he, superb. And he has wow. promised vengeance, and everything you say, John. I'm so I'm I'm really petrified. I know somewhere right now he's scheming. Oh, he he won't let that go. No. Oh no. No, no, no. I mean, it was the same with, well, essentially, one of one of the great motivators for making the, the second season of Men and Kills was that he still hated me for losing at golf and rugby. I mean, well, you know the list. It's huge. And the rest of it. <laughs> Word of a game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, he lost. Right. Spectacular. <laughs> Constantly. Sure. And then he Big was forced loser. naked yeah. into the North Atlantic. And uh, I think that that has just haunted him, really. And um, Right. Uh, I, I've always imagined that while he was on set filming Outlander, he'd just be in the corner, like writing lists of things yeah. that he wants to do to torment me. And he's, he worked through quite a few of them in this second season, for oh, sure. Okay. Something for us to look forward to, at least. You're still <laughs> yeah. here. You're still alive. You're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I want to let's let's talk a little bit about the the new series, which there's obviously yeah. a ton of curiosity about House of the Dragon. This is a prequel series, to the Game of Thrones, a little show that had a bit of a following. Um, I got a chance to see the first episode. I don't think I can say much, but I think people will not be disappointed. It certainly feels Game of Thronesy, but also introduces this amazing, yeah. amazing ensemble. Of actors, I mean Patty Considine, yep. um, uh, Reese Ifans, uh, I, I, Olivia Cook's not even in the first episode. There's a great, great ensemble here. I know. Uh, talk to me a little bit about. Look, I mean, is the when you sign on to something like this, like is the job different when you're in a fan, quote unquote fantasy world? Is like the job to like ground it in a way because I think that's what Game of Thrones did very well, and I think mm. this show does too, which is like, yeah, they're dragons. But it has a palpable, I don't know, yeah. it's really about family and betrayal and, and, yes, and, and all yes, of that. It's a very good, yeah, it's a very good point. And I think it's, uh, it's a danger that that genre could fall into, that it all just becomes terribly kind of, we are in a fantasy world right. and everybody talks like this. Right. It, it's, it, they, they're people who are experiencing their lives um, admittedly fictional lives but they just happen to be surrounded by extraordinary things um i mean you know if you set it during the second world war you would be surrounded by extraordinary things as well just the sure. different kind of stuff but yeah you do have to you do have to ground it i mean to some extent when you're um when you're walking uh into the throne room on house of the dragon and there's the iron throne at the end of a a, a stage that it was the entire soundstage was that set. So it was enormous. And uh, I had to enter um, with Millie, who plays Rainier, young Rainier. Right. And uh, we, um, we both just thought, oh my God, you, you barely need to act. I mean, you're, you're in this incredible costume, which is somewhat heavy, not too heavy. You've got a giant sword. You're surrounded by enormous statues. There's the Iron Throne at the end. It's all lit with flames. I mean, you're like, yeah, it's fantastic. You just, and if, and if you can access that part of yourself, which I, I think actors love to do, which is really their childish side. Yes. Um, it's just a playground, really. And, uh, and you, you get, well, you have a script, but you get to just um, play around and be, be hang, having fun with each other in that extraordinary setting. And it's true of all of those fantasy world same with the witcher sure um i think one thing i would say about fantasy possibly more than anything else and i would include outlander in this actually because there is a big big kind of fantasy element in outlander um is that you're um you have a lot of laughs a lot of laughs on set it actually seems to encourage even more childish behavior is that because of just like the costumes and the absurdity of some situations? Like, oh yeah, we're st we're all starting at a dragon. This is insane. Come on. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, like on House of the Dragon, I remember there was a scene where we encounter one of the dragons and it flies over our head and it's not giving anything away. We're we're, we're there. Wait, wait, there are dragons in House of the Dragon, Graham. You're about to be fired. I know. <laughs> there's more than one. Um, and there's there's literally uh, it was a laser dot. Right flying over our heads. And the director, who I'd actually worked with many, many years before, called Greg Yotanis, um, we did a TV series called Empire together. And he, he said, okay, you know, the dragon's coming. And uh, it's, uh, so you, you need to, uh, you're scared. You need to react. And you're like, right, okay. So it's really big, okay? It's huge, yes. And it's, it's flying right over your head, okay? So on action, there was a varying degree as to how people reacted. Some people really went for it. Right. But there's always, especially if you're in a group, you don't want to, you don't want to be the one that completely embarrasses themselves. You all and have like to be at the same level. The yeah. Ground, yeah. You're weeping, uh, <laughs> you know, the sight of the dragon. So I, I remember my first take, it was more of a head bob. It was oh. more of a kind of like, oh, there's a dragon. Oh, there it is. <laughs> You know, oh, it's going over there. Some people were like, "Ah, oh, God!" <laughs> throwing themselves to the ground, and I thought, "Too much. That's going too far." Right. And so there were all different levels of reaction. And Greg and I thought I'd done a fantastic job. And Greg came up and said, um, 
Graham, you, you really need to react. And I went, well, I was reacting, Greg. He said, no, no, this is terrifying. This is a dragon. And you're seeing it flying over your head. And I go, yeah, well, you know, yeah. But I, I just don't feel I would be that scared. And it's not, not his first dragon. You've seen others. I, exactly. I'm Lord Commander of the King's Guard. I've yeah. seen many dragons. Yeah. But he insisted that I was, I, I reacted more severely to the sight of the dragon. And But that's, that's the kind of thing that you have a huge laugh right. doing that stuff. Uh, Reese well, fans, particularly, was, it was very... He won't mind me saying this. It was very difficult getting through a scene with this. <laughs> he was constantly trying to make you laugh, deliberately mangling the lines, calling people by absurd names, even more absurd than their actual names <clears throat> in the show. Right. He would anything to make you laugh. So, well, uh, and we did. So. Well, let's practice reacting to a dragon. I want to. I want to see if I can do it. Okay. So, so what? What level? Give me one to ten. What level of reaction should we have as we watch this dragon pass over us right now? You. Yeah. You yeah. Or both of yeah. us. We're both of us. We're both going to see the same dragon pass okay. through our screens. Okay. So I think. Think. Okay. We're not complete cowards. Okay. Uh, but That's a stretch for me. Not... But I'll try it. Well, okay. No, no, no. Well, this is you know <laughs> this is in the context of the moment. Okay. Okay. You know, obviously, in real life, you're, a, you're yeah, yeah. A complete coward. Yeah. But. But, you know, we're not complete cowards, but we're also not stupid. Okay. So, Again, a stretch, but okay, I'll try it. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm identifying the very two things that you are actually. <laughs> what I'm known for, cowardice and idiot. stupidity. <laughs> yes. 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 A, a, a frightened buffoon. Uh, so I'm just, You're sounding more and more like your friend all every day. You're, yes. This is reminding so me. Yeah. I'm going, I'm going for a steady five. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll cue us in. Okay, which direction so, am I looking? And, uh, it's going to be coming from my right. So yes, we're both looking in the same direction. Okay. 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 Uh, I'll take the glasses off just in case it gets too violent. Okay. So the dragon is coming. Um, three, two, one. <gasps> oh, Josh! What did I do? That was just—I just caught it out of the corner of my eye. That was. That was. What? what Hopefully. Was that? Hopefully, folks are just listening to this, and they, it was no, wasted on them. <laughs> I don't care if they need to know. He is terrible. This is why I still have not gotten my Outlander cameo. I've been campaigning for years. It's just I, I, at this point, I'm, I'm going to settle for Men in Kilts. I'm, re reality is where it's at. No, seriously, I would love to see that. I think what you need to be. Yeah. Let me think. If you were doing Outlander, yeah. I think you need to be the sort of the the village drunken idiot um, that, that the camera you, I mean you can be seated for it so you don't need to do any walking and talking. oh thanks yeah good so just like give you give you like a big mug of ale or something like that a big slouchy hat a bit of a plaid and then people are walking past you and then they look down the camera catches you on the left and you just say I don't know morning Jimmy See if you can make Morning, Jimmy. Okay, you look like you're having a stroke. <laughs> I had the right mug for it and everything. You had the right mug. Although I guess, in a, to be fair, in an Outlander scene, you wouldn't have a mug that says Outlander on it. That would be a little odd. That <laughs> <laughs> might take people out of the mug. <laughs> that would be actually brilliant that if, if we had that. Yes, that we had branded, like Sam was drinking from a bottle of Sassanac whiskey. Exactly. During a scene. I wouldn't know, put it past him. It's going to happen at some point. Well, he did it in every scene in Men in Kilts. Right. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> every single time we stopped, he goes, sure, um, any chance we could get this? And I said, mate. Shameless. Is some extended commercial for your whiskey brand. And he went, isn't it? <laughs> it's all it is for him now. It's one big yeah. whiskey ad. Uh, I'm going to look at some uh, questions from our audience. Let's see. Okay. Yes. Um, Sandra wants to know, will you be playing any part in the Outlander prequel? Any chance of a young version of your character? It's the parents, well, as you know. I mean, you know, uh, it's obviously I look so young. As it is. <laughs> yeah, no makeup required. Yep. No makeup required. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Would it be a teenage Dougal? I mean, I, I mean... It would be a stretch for me to play myself <laughs> as a teenager, but um, I'm always willing to try. Okay. 
Fair enough. The old college try. Uh, Linda wants to know, what is the project that you've been working on in Montana? I've been curious about that, too. You spent oh. so much of your summer in Montana, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a great movie. Um, it's called Somewhere in Montana. And it is a modern day, uh, it's a ranch western kind of film. I play the rancher, a guy called John Alexander. And uh, he, uh, it, it, without going into the whole thing, what I loved about it is that it, it's a film about um, tolerance and listening to others, really. That there, that there are two groups of people represented in the film that are very different to each other in terms of how they view the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And while neither of those groups particularly ends up thinking, oh, you're right, I'm wrong, because they get to know each other, they respect each other. And, and I think one of the reasons I was so keen to do it is that it, 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 it's, it contains within it a really, really important, timely lesson, or not a lesson, just a comment really on the, sure. on the world, which is it's okay to not agree with everybody and for people not to agree with you as long as you treat each other respectfully. And uh, that's, that's, that's something that I worry about in the world that we're living in at the moment and this film really 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 addresses it in a in a very clever way yeah um not not in a not in a kind of schmaltzy way it's 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 there you know you're like nobody's shying away from anything it's it's really good so i was i had a wonderful experience and i loved montana i i just fell in love with the place i thought it was gorgeous well, I mean, you're, you're spot on. I mean, obviously, we've seen, we talked about sci-fi and fantasy. Genre always is just the prism by which we can look at the world. And yeah. Western is nothing if not one of our great genres. So it makes total Absolutely. sense. One of the great um, American genres, yeah. All right, I'm going to invite Karen on screen. Karen, you have a question. I hope you're prepared. Let's see if this works. Here we go. Karen, oh, boy. Karen. Let's see if this is my first attempt. Oh. Wish me luck. Okay. Wish Karen luck. Karen. Rather you than me. Yeah, we would I know. never get to see Karen if I was doing this. Karen, are you there? If you don't pop up, I'll just ask ask your question for you, Karen. Don't worry. Oh, oh she is. Oh, something's happening. Oh, there hi, you are. hi, Hello. Karen. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. What's your question for Graham? Um, my question was if you're going to be writing a memoir like Sam Hewen did. Am I going to be? Yes. Um, well, it's it's definitely crossed my mind. Um. I think, you know, what, what I'm interested in, if I was to do that, is not so much a kind of chronology of experience, but really just a, um, an examination, I suppose, of, of what it is to do the kind of thing that I've done in, as, a, as an actor. It's a very strange world and a very, um, you know, there, there's, I, I think there are, uh, perceptions about the acting business that are not correct and um, you know I think that there's a there's a sort of there's a glamour attached to it and all the rest of it and th there are glamorous things attached to it that's true but there's also all sorts of other stuff I'm yeah. actually reading at the moment David Niven's autobiography oh that's a famous one I feel like yeah yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I've been reading that for decades and I finally got around to reading it and and that's a great great memoir because He's so, he's honest. He's just honest. And I think that's the key to be honest with yourself and in doing so, providing something to other people to read that is truthful. Right. Um, and I think that's true of, of, uh, of any creative endeavor, to be honest, acting. You know, you, you do it. I think the best way of describing it is if I was to do it, I would be doing it for myself. And in doing that, hopefully other people might be interested. So. Was that, like, if I was talking to you when you first started acting, and presumably that was in theater, I would guess, back in the in the early days, like, what was the ambition, what was the dream back then? I mean, was it, uh, I mean, yes. was there an actor on the pedestal? Was there a career to aspire to? I mean, what were you thinking? Um, was it a life in the theater? What were you thinking? Oh, well, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Because uh, I think really... If I'm honest, um, when I started, uh, I mean, the first job I, I did actually was uh, I was an extra on a TV show called The Master of Ballantrae, 
which is a very famous Scottish novel by Robert Louis Stevenson. And um, Michael York and Timothy Dalton were the leads. And I had like a day, two days on it or something. I was so excited, I absolutely loved it. I loved, I loved the costumes. I mean, and actually, ironically, it's set in the same period as Outland. So, oh, well. weirdly enough, yeah, it's kind of odd. I hadn't actually thought about that until that moment. But that was in 1983 or something. And, and I was so excited. My father actually took a photo of me. He froze the video. And there was a, me and Michael York on screen together for like a nanosecond. And he took a picture. And I, oh. I still have the picture. But I, I was, um, I loved, I loved film and TV. And I was a huge Clint Eastwood fan, huge. You know, he was my idol, really. And I used to stand in front of the mirror and try and try and make myself look like him. I would in my brow, I would do that. <laughs> and, you know, when I was 12, and uh, it was pathetic. But I, I, so really, if I'm honest, in answer to your question, very long winded way of saying it, my ambition always lay more in film and television than in theatre. I love, don't get me wrong, I love theatre and I've loved doing theatre and I've been really lucky in the, 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 the work that I've been able to do, especially in Scotland. I got to be in all sorts of shows that I wouldn't have been able to be in. And I, I just loved working. I loved the process. I loved the collaboration. Yeah. That's what I really enjoyed. I was never particularly motivated by um, all those sort of slightly more venal things like, you know, fame and money and, you know, glory awards or anything like that. I, I, I just, I mean, everybody fantasizes about going sure. and getting an Oscar, but, you know, I, I, to, to be honest with you, I, I, I don't anymore. Um, I, don't, I don't think about that stuff. It, I just want to do interesting uh, work, and that's what's always always motivated me and it just so happens that for the last 16 years which is the last time I was on stage it's all been on uh, film and television but um, it's been you know it's it's great you know you get to I've been a Roman I've been a Highlander I've been a dwarf I've been you know and those are the things to go back to that whole childhood thing yeah that, that's what you all dream of when you're children being a cowboy you know uh and so all of those moments um, were very meaningful to me uh, as, as sort of ful fulfillment of dreams, I suppose. Yeah. And that's, I think, as long as you stay a dreamer as an actor, I think you won't go far wrong. Do you have a, I've been asking folks on the podcast the last couple of years uh, about comfort movies. Just off the top of your head, is there a movie that you would deem a comfort movie for you? It could be an Eastwood movie or anything that you've returned to that you find mm. centers you, calms you, brings you back to childhood, whatever comfort means to you. Something that jumps out? Yeah, well, there's a few uh, for different reasons, I suppose. Um, the Princess Bride is a, I, I love The Princess Bride. Um, I, 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 if I met Carrie Elwes um, or Mandy, or, and actually, I did meet. Um, oh my God, I'm going to forget her name now. What, well, Robin um, Wright Penn? Yes, Robin. Robin, Robin Wright. Yes, yeah, yeah. I met her when. Um, and it, it was a very strange moment, actually. I was doing the finest hours, and her then partner Ben Foster was in the finest hours. Yes. And we were in. A, we were all in a house in Chatham, in Massachusetts, and I was in the bedroom upstairs. Everyone was downstairs just chatting, and I just wanted to be alone. And I was reading Carrie Elwes's. Um, memoir. Yeah, the Princess of, Bride uh, memoir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Princess yeah. Bride. Yeah, right? yeah. I was reading that great book, reading away, you know, reading about Robin and blah, blah, blah. Shut the book, thought, oh, I'll go down and say hi. And there was Robin Wright sitting in the living room. And I was like, and I was so, I, I couldn't tell her. I couldn't. I couldn't <laughs> You're like say, hiding the book. You're like, never mind. I reading about you. <laughs> I couldn't, but I just thought, life is strange. But so the Princess Bride, definitely. Yeah. I've watched that many times. Mouse Hunt. Have you seen Mouse Hunt? Wait, Mouse Hunt, the Gore Verbinski movie? The, uh, the... With Nathan Lane yeah. and uh, Lee, yeah. Lee, what's his name? Um, oh, I, I know exactly what you mean. Christopher Walken. That's... I love that film so much. Random but amazing. I love it, Graham. <laughs> I've watched it with kids. I've watched it. I've probably watched that at least six times. I, I, it's such a lovely movie. Um, and for any of you who haven't watched it, do watch it. 
and I won't spoil anything about it. It's just a delight. Uh, so that, and then completely the other way, yeah. Zulu. Zulu. Oh, oh wait, Michael Caine? Is that? Uh... That's Michael Caine's first yeah. film. Yes. Produ written, uh, sorry, produced and starring uh, Stanley um, Baker. Stanley okay. Baker. Uh, written and directed by Cy Enfield. Uh, all shot in South Africa with the, the Zulu nation involved, the grandson of King Chetaweo, who was the person at Rourke's Drift. I mean, I'm huge into history and all of those. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Incredible Checks all the episode. boxes. Yep. It's an incredible episode in history. And uh, I love that film. I've watched that probably a dozen times. Oh, wow. And it doesn't matter. The music, the performances, the Technicolor, big screen. Oh, it's fantastic. I so, love it. Yeah, those, those, are, those are great. Michael Caine has a, a good memoir or two, as I, as I recall as well. Um, indeed, indeed. Oh, right. Kay has a question here. What will be your next mega franchise? Well, they're greedy. They want more. We got Hobbit. <laughs> we got Outlander. We got Witcher, House of Dragon, Castlevania. What's the ultimate for you? Yeah, let's World think. So, so Graham... Yeah, exactly. We, ha we haven't done, I mean, in the voiceover world, you've covered some like Star Wars and Marvel, but like live action-wise, you haven't. That's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, yes, that's true. My eldest daughter is obsessed with the idea, the idea of me being in a Marvel project. Obsessed. She, she, I mean, barely a week goes by where she's saying, you know, have you, have you got into a Marvel project yet? I'm like, no, no, I'm not, no. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm busy, but, you know, one day, you never know. So, yeah, that would be, that would be amazing. Uh, I, I obviously, I grew up, like everybody else, with that world. Um, you know, in the whole Spider-Man franchise. I mean, I was a huge Spider-Man fan when I was a kid. Those kind of comics. Uh, Star Wars as well. Yes, I was a huge, huge Star Wars fan. Um, you know, those those TV series spin-offs, I think, have been really, really amazing. So I'd, yeah. uh, you know, that kind of world. Or indeed, this is what I think as well, a, 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 a world or a story that hasn't been written yet. You know, there's out there somewhere at this moment, there is somebody writing something that is just going to blow everybody away. And it might not happen for five years or whatever, but it's going to be amazing. And that's that's the great thing about this industry. You know, there's there's so many people. I have a really good friend, actually, who um, I met him. He was a barista in uh, Santa Monica and he used to serve me coffee and we got talking a lot and we became friends. And he is now writing for a Marvel movie. He was a writer that he was an Amazing. aspiring writer and he is now writing it. And I love that. I love that, you know, there he is working hard and everything like that. And then his that that dream, that world came true for him. And and so there are people as we speak that are either about to write something or in the middle of writing something that's gonna be truly incredible. Amazing. Do you uh do you still have to audition at this point, Graham? Does the body of work speak for itself? Are you will? Are you like? Is that? Are you like game, or is it kind of like? Look I at my 100, 123 IMDb credits. No, I, I honestly. I mean, if they want me to um, do us, I mean, nowadays it seems to be just self tapes. That's what right. we do. I don't. Right. You know, I haven't met a, another human um, for these sort of things for a very long time. Yeah. Sometimes there are they are offers. Uh, which is all obviously very, very nice, um, and sometimes not. But I love, I've always loved, um, and it's it's a sort of arrogance, I suppose, but it's, it's also what motivated me when I first went to America, was that I always wanted the opportunity, just the chance to show people what I could do. Yeah, That's all I wanted. Just put me in the room, let me try. If you don't like it, that's fine, but just let me try. And so... I've always carried that with me that if if I'm given the chance, then well, then it becomes out of my hands. Right. But I, I've always wanted to have the chance. So I'm not fussy about, you know, if somebody says, well, we, we really want to see, we want to meet Graham or we want to sell him to self tape. I'm not going to go, oh, no, 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 I don't do that. Uh, I, I absolutely I, I don't mind at all. I'm curious because look, we've talked about like these these major kind of franchises with these built-in kind of audiences, and you've been in some of the biggest, literally, that exist. And yet, like I've met you through Outlander, which 
is has a very sizable audience, but it's not the Hobbit audience. It's not the Lord of the Rings in terms of size, but it is, mm. I would argue, in terms of passion and in terms of just a a yes. a, 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 a and I say this in the nicest way, obsession. And I've I've experienced mm. that on the periphery. Do you sure. do you feel that too? Like, do you feel a difference in the kind of fandom that Outlander has brought you, as opposed to just the sheer mm. volume that something like Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit brought sure. you? Sure. Yes, I would say yes. Uh, I don't think I've ever encountered um, a, a fan base that is as dedicated as the Outlander fan base, and it's great. You know, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. I mean, you know, mostly <clears throat> if people speak to me out in the street or whatever, uh, they talk about Outlander. Um, sometimes they'll really surprise you and talk you talk to you about something completely like. I remember you in Stones, like Red Dwarf, and I'll go, oh, yeah, I mean, that was 24 <laughs> years ago. Uh, and so it varies. But Outlander fans are, um, they are incredibly loyal and supportive. And that's, you know, um, I know Sam, myself, anybody actually, Duncan, Katrina, anybody involved in it is really, really appreciative of that. Um, yeah. and, don't, and don't take it lightly either. Um, because... You know, you 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 have to be um, you have to be creative yourself. You know, you have to have one half of your brain when you're doing, for instance, something like Outlander. When we were filming it, we had to make it our own. You know, I had to make Dougal the Dougal I wanted him to be, and with collaboration with other people. Uh, but at the same time, you are aware that there is literally a group of millions of people yeah. who have a very strong idea. Who, Jamie or Claire is, and uh, you have to be mindful of that. <clears throat> so it's a it's a it's a it's a tricky line to walk, but um, I think that on the whole, the the way that it's been handled by the writers and the producers and the cast and everything and the fans together, that we've all we've all moved forward together with the show, which is which is really uh, remarkable, actually. It's been it's been fun, especially like look at first it was basically Sam and Katrina that I got to know, and then like as the years have mm. gone on, they finally mm. let me meet their friends. I feel like they were just like trying to keep me from everybody, and now I, I appreciate what a great ensemble this is, and how you all are just like such a great fun group, well, and have just like senses of humor and the right attitude, and it's just it's a joy to. Well, that that was the thing when we did it, um, when we first did it. You know, partly because it was essentially Katrina's first job. Right. Uh, it was. It wasn't Sam's first job, but it was his first major, real big role. Yeah. Um, and we were all thrown in together, and and that created immediately a very tight group. Um, so all those Highlanders, uh, Katrina, uh, Lotta, you know, um, Gary, all of these guys together, we 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 really bonded and were working with each other. Uh, so there was no kind of hierarchy at all, which which always makes for a much better product. Are you already look? We don't know when the next season of Men in Kilts is, but are you? Mm. Do you have the third location in mind? Do you think back to Scotland? Do you think another locale? Have you decided, or still deciding, or what? Um, if I you think, have the you know, opportunity to do obviously. a third series, I mean, I, I think the logical place would be North America. Um, I would, I would really be keen. I know, and Sam, I know, is the same. I think we're both very keen on the idea of, of exploring the Canadian American links uh, there. You know, it's just about navigating through through the country. I mean, I when I was in Montana, I met um, a Native American gentleman called um, Donald McDonald, and uh, he is descended from the McDonald's of Glencoe. Um, there was a huge uh, settlement in that area of Montana, the direct descendants of McKeon of Glencoe, the, the famous massacre. They came over and settled in that part of Montana. And there are so many wonderful stories to tell of the interaction and the relationships between Native American tribes and uh, Klansmen, Highlanders coming over in the 18th and 19th centuries. I, I think that's a. There's so much to talk about with that. So uh, that would be where I would want to 
sold. Hey, it's more convenient for me to crash. It's perfect. Look, I, I think the, the bonus of this conversation today, look, the, 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 the reason to do it was to catch up with you. And I always love chatting with you. You're always so generous with your time and are good natured and good humored. Uh, and, I, and I love it. But the bonus, honestly, is just infuriating Sam and how jealous he's going to be when he sees that we've been chatting That's for right. an hour today. So That's great, isn't it? That's what gets so, me up in the morning. It's a win-win. It's a total win-win. I mean, I woke up this morning and I thought, today's the day that I managed to just rub it in his face again. And <laughs> it's, I know it's petty. I know, I know. You gotta play petty. on the level he's playing on. He's that, yeah. we have to be that. He brought us to this point. And um, so we're down there in the mud with him. And uh, yeah, yeah. It's Look really at this, cool. Sam. This is a love affair right here and you can't touch yeah. it. Yeah, we're really happy without you, Sam. Ha, ha, ha. I'm actually just waiting. And that's one of the reasons I've turned my phone off because I know that he would be <laughs> just, you know, shut up. Nobody cares. You're so bald. You're old. He's probably You're watching us hair. right now. Uh, congratulations, sir. Thanks for taking the time out. Uh, enjoy the rest of your run on The Witcher. I can't wait to see that. And Thank I know you. the the audience is going to be thrilled with this one. House of the Dragon, it really yeah. lives up to the, yeah. the pedigree. The I, I, I I don't want to tempt fate, but I truly believe that people will love this show. Yes. Has another one. I was going to say, I didn't even mention my, my beloved Matt Smith, whom I'm obsessed with. He's amazing. In oh, show are you too. also obsessed with Matt Smith? You're, you're obsessed with quite a lot of people. <laughs> I, mean, I have a problem. If you, you haven't figured it out. I mean, just off camera, are there little kind of little, like a shrine? Of, Do I have anything new? Of I, people, I probably have other incriminating things little, near me, but I'm not going to show you. Balls of Matt and... <laughs> Curious. No, Matt is also a very, very nice guy. Yeah. Um, very funny. And yeah. we had enormous laughs. His sword is called Dark Sister. In, in the show or just? Or yes, I haven't... in the show. Wow. It's mentioned many times. It's called <laughs> Dark Sister. And every single time, and I, I'm not ashamed to admit this, that every single time uh, sa uh, he would appear with the sword, I would go, I would stand there and wait for him to pass and go, well, oh, watch out, here comes Dark Sister. <laughs> yes. And every time he would laugh, it's pathetic. I know it's pathetic. We're all just children. We're really just still children. This is, this is the atmosphere that we created on set. It was yeah. a childish, very, very sad atmosphere. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for watching today. Uh, we'll see you on the next one. And my biggest thanks of all, of course, to the one and only Mr. Graham McTavish. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Josh. Always a pleasure. All right. I'll nice see you in the next you. one. Thanks, buddy. All right.